This program was made possible by the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program, the Marine Sciences Research Center's Institute of Urban Ports and Harbors at the University at Stony Brook, Rutgers University's Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences. Here in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area, we are more than 15 million of the busiest people in the world. Rushing around, we often miss the beauty and the drama that surrounds us. And what surrounds us is water. Just off the well-traveled roads, under the bridges and over the tunnels, there is a world within these turbid waters. On marshlands spared the spread of concrete, on forgotten islands, and along the coastline long since transformed to serve the needs of people. This is the story of this world, staked out by wildlife, striving to adapt to an overbearing human presence. This is the story of being alive in an urban harbor. The New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary is used in many different ways by many different people. Swimming at Coney Island. Enjoying the view of the Hudson River from the west side of Manhattan. Clamming in Raritan Bay. Shipping oil to a terminal in the Arthur Kill. Sailing past the Statue of Liberty. Or sending sewage out into Flushing Bay. In the crossfire of these conflicting uses, it's often easy to overlook the original use of these waters. That of habitat for the thousands of species which share this urban estuary with us. One such species is a native fish called the shad. On this crisp morning in May, on the lower Hudson River, Ron Ingold and his crew are commuting to work. They are shad fishermen. Towering over the small boat, the George Washington Bridge, jammed with commuters, is a powerful reminder of the urban environment that surrounds them. Yet today will be another good day in what has been a very good season. Today, some 2,000 pounds of fresh Hudson River shad will be hauled into this boat these shad have spent most of their lives out at sea, far from these urban waters. In early spring, they return to the same spawning ground up the Hudson River where they first swam some five years ago. The fish caught today have been in the river for about 12 hours. The fish are kept clean because of their long residence in the open ocean. But even here, in the Lower Hudson, once considered little more than an open sewer, the waters are cleaner today than they were just 20 years ago. This, due primarily to the Federal Clean Water Act of 1972, which mandated improvement in the treatment of sewage discharged into U.S. coastal waters. The fact that we can catch and eat these fish the fact that the shad population in the Hudson River appears to be flourishing is a testimonial to the blood, sweat, and tears that thousands of men and women poured into getting this river cleaned up, to making it a usable estuary once again. But in different parts of the estuary, scientists are beginning to learn that natural circulation can be a key to cleaner waters. Aboard the Onrust, 
the research vessel of the Marine Sciences Research Center of the University at Stony Brook, fishery biologist Peter Woodhead describes the circulation in upper New York, New Jersey Harbor. We're very, very lucky here. Uh, the reason why we've, we've got a, a large fish population, a large fish community, is nothing that we've done per se. We've dumped in the harbor for a century, and uh, things could have gone quite dead here. But there's a very vigorous tidal flushing twice a day. The tides exchange the water all the time, replenishment, replenishment. From the air, one can begin to see the dynamics of the New York, New Jersey Harbor estuary. The land is a cluster of islands, an urban archipelago, divided by water bodies, which constantly exchange water with each other. The Hudson River pumps millions of gallons of fresh water every minute into upper New York Bay. The winding rivers of New Jersey, the Hackensack, Passaic, Rahway, and Raritan also pump nutrient-rich river water into the bays. Coming the other way is salt water surging through the Verrazano Narrows from the Atlantic Ocean on a flood tide. This salt water intrusion is so strong, salt water will sometimes push 80 miles up the Hudson to Poughkeepsie. This incoming tide also drives up through the East River, pumping East River waters into western Long Island Sound. On the ebb tide, water is drawn from the western Sound back through the East River, serving to flush the upper harbor. The mixture of salt water from the ocean and fresh water from rivers classifies this as an estuary, the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary. And it is one feature of a larger marine ecosystem, including the Long Island Sound, the Hudson River Watershed, the New York Bight, and the Atlantic Ocean. Having two vigorous seawater inputs makes this an unusual estuary and helps keep parts of it well flushed. Other parts of the system, however, are poorly flushed, such as Upper Newark Bay and Jamaica Bay. In these areas, contaminants tend to stay for a long time, polluting the water and the bottom sediments. When these sediments build up, they must be dredged to allow for safe navigation. What to do with these sediments, often laden with heavy metals and organic contaminants, is a thorny issue. After all, contaminants may linger in the water column for weeks, perhaps months, but they reside in the bottom sediments for centuries. Today, these students from the Cherry Hill Elementary School in New Jersey are about to learn just how life is faring in the harbor estuary. Aboard the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, they will encounter firsthand life in this urban harbor. How far to the fishing ground? In the shadow of a mighty metropolis, these students are going fishing. Many of the students were surprised by what they found. Well, I didn't expect to find some of the animals because a lot of people say that the Hudson River it has a lot of pollution in it, but they, they're showing us how it's coming back. Before I got in the boat, I thought things were really bad because I heard all these stories about the Hudson. But um, after being on the boat, I think things are getting a lot better. But just to the west of this fishing expedition, the view of the shoreline becomes quite different. Here is one of the most industrialized waterfronts in the world, the Kill Van Kull and the Arthur Kill. Kill is the Dutch term for river, though in fact, these are not rivers at all, but tidal straits, which separate Staten Island from New Jersey. The kills are surrounded by oil and chemical refineries, industrial waste sites, massive shipping terminals, and the 3,000-acre Fresh Kills Landfill, the largest landfill in the world. The marine environment here 
takes a continuous pounding from toxic materials seeping through the landfill to small oil and chemical spills. Occasionally, the spills are much larger, such as the Bayway refinery disaster of January 1990. But the chronic, smaller releases of oil and chemicals are actually greater in volume than the large spills. In fact, it is estimated that each year more oil and grease is discharged from treatment plants and street drains than was spilled by the Exxon Valdez in Alaska's Prince William Sound. The kills are the center of the shipping industry in the harbor port, one of the busiest ports in the nation. New York, New Jersey Harbor is considered perhaps to be the finest natural harbor in the world. Despite the changes in land use, the economic value of, of the maritime activities is still extraordinary. It's almost an $18 billion industry with 180,000 jobs in the whole metropolitan area. We handle 30 million long tons of, of just containerized cargo each year, plus uh, additional bulk traffic, primarily oil imports through the port. And if we add it to the the economic activity of the three airports, which are also urban as well as waterfront based, we're looking at a total of $40 billion a year in economic activity. Yet amid the oil, the noise, and the debris of a busy port on Shooter's Island in the Kilvan Cove, birds have found sanctuary. interesting things, I think, is that birds can adapt to a wide variety of circumstances. So although we look in an area such as the New York Harbor and such as the Arthur Kill in particular, and it looks a mess to us. There's garbage, there are pilings, there are old deserted boats, there are old buildings. But when you go and you actually look at the birds that nest in that area and you look at the invertebrates that are there, you find out that in fact there are healthy populations. And so I think it's time that we begin asking the wildlife how they respond to the habitat rather than how we respond to it aesthetically. Joanna Berger, professor of ecology from the Institute for Coastal and Marine Sciences at Rutgers University, has been studying the bird populations in the kills for 20 years. The colony of herons that is here and the colony of, of uh, herring gulls, these are some of the largest in the, in the East Coast and they're, they're having high reproduction, their breeding is going along very well, their populations are increasing. So despite the fact that we may look at it as an area that's not very interesting and that it's not very wild and it's not very aesthetically pleasing, the birds are doing their thing here very successfully. Tractor trailers hauling New Jersey's trash to a transfer station in the Hackensack Meadowlands. Part wildlife refuge, part municipal and industrial development zone, the meadowlands are unique in the harbor estuary. These days, the area is perhaps best known as the home of the New Jersey sports complex, yet this vast tidal marsh has another prominent distinction. It is a major stopover for birds migrating along the Atlantic Flyway, a migratory route that stretches from the Arctic tundra to the rainforest of South America. It is also one of the most vital spawning grounds and nurseries for fish in the region. But in the meadowlands, the song of the wildfowl competes with the roar of the New Jersey Turnpike. Most people's uh, a judgment of the Meadowlands is done at 60, 65 miles an hour along the New Jersey Turnpike or Route 3 uh, if they're not in a traffic jam. Uh, and uh, they don't get out to see firsthand what's here. I always say the Meadows has two personalities. It's one uh, buzzing by in an automobile looking out the window. That's one view, but it's an entirely different view being in the Meadows looking out of it. Don Smith is the chief naturalist at the Hackensack Meadowlands Environmental Center. He grew up fishing and hunting amongst the reeds and creeks here. Some of the best wetland biologists in the country have visited this area 
and uh, did not ha hold a, a high opinion of it prior to coming into it and were just blown away by all the things they saw here. And uh, they said, well, uh, the, the life requisites are here for the critters and they're telling you that. And uh, it's just our job uh, to protect those areas, to enhance them when possible and uh, uh, make it a healthier environment both for the animals and for the people that live around here. Concorde supersonic transport takes off from Kennedy Airport and flies over Jamaica Bay. To the wildlife living here, this must indeed be a strange presence of the human species. What was once 4,500 acres of coastal wildlife habitat is now the runways and terminals of Kennedy Airport. But out in the shallow bay, isolated marshy islands create an oasis from the urban crunch that surrounds it. Chief naturalist Don Ripe has been studying the wildlife in Jamaica Bay for over 30 years. The Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge is one part of the Gateway National Recreation Area, which includes Sandy Hook in New Jersey and the Green Belt on the southern shore of Staten Island. Well, over the last 30 years, I've seen uh, a lot more birding activity, many more species coming into the New York area. Things like glossy ibis didn't nest here previous to 1960, uh, oyster catchers, and willets were not here 20 years ago. So a lot of birds that were primarily found a little farther south have extended their ranges uh, northward here. In fact, many species of birds uh, nesting at Kennedy Airport do so right at the edges of runways, and there are a few species that only nest in that area. Uh, the upland sandpiper, for example, uh, has a good colony of this particular species at Kennedy and nowhere else in the New York City area. I think water quality has been getting better over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, primarily because of the uh, uh, upgrading of the sewage treatment plants. The four main tr plants around the bay are now, have been upgraded to secondary treatment. So that has increased uh, perhaps the level of dissolved oxygen, increased dissolved oxygen levels in the bay. Well, while dissolved oxygen has improved over the last uh, 80 to 90 years, uh, there are other contaminants of concern in New York Harbor waters that cause uh, different, different types of problems. For example, uh, shellfishing is uh, uh, banned in most of the harbor primarily because uh, fecal coliform, which also is a byproduct of the sewage treatment process, is accumulated by those organisms. Here in Great Kills Harbor, Staten Island, these clammers are digging clams from waters declared off-limits because of the high coliform count. Yet, they are not poachers. These clammers have been authorized to dig these clams under a special clam transplant program run by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. The clams are packed in special bags and immediately shipped to the cleaner waters of Peconic Bay in eastern Long Island, where they are placed in cleansing racks. Because clams filter so much water, up to 50 gallons a day, after 21 days, these clams have purged themselves of fecal coliform. But clams are susceptible to other contaminants as well, such as heavy metals, viruses, and organic contaminants which accumulate on the bottom. This transplant program points out the importance of clean waters to the region's economy. In Raritan Bay alone, it is estimated that $600 million worth of hard shell clams cannot be harvested because of high coliform counts and other pollutants. Tourism and the value of coastal real estate 
two of the largest industries in the region, also depend on the quality of the water. The next major frontier to improve water quality are CSOs, Combined Sewer Overflows. In the New York, New Jersey area, for the most part, the same sewer that carries the storm water off the pavement also carries household and industrial sewage to the sewage treatment plant. However, only a third of an inch of rain during a seven hour period is enough to overload the system. The overflow, containing human waste, lawn fertilizers, dog feces, motor oil and street litter, is diverted into the harbor estuary. The prototype of a solution to this problem has been operating on Jamaica Bay since 1972, a CSO abatement facility. Instead of being diverted into the bay, rainwater containing sewage is directed to these holding tanks. The water is then pumped back to the sewage treatment plant during dry weather. Both New York and New Jersey have embarked on CSO abatement programs to construct upgraded versions of this facility around the harbor estuary. These programs are expected to take over a decade to complete and cost in excess of two billion dollars. CSOs discharge an enormous amount of floating pollution, plastic, styrofoam, paper and cloth. It is estimated that every month 77,000 candy wrappers and 42,000 plastic straws are discharged into the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary. The truth master back. Yeah, okay, there's uh, a large uh, tree floating in the vicinity of uh, Port Elizabeth, Port Ivory. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Cap. We were dispatched this way to uh, Bergen Point, Newark Bay, so uh, we're going to come across it. We'll scoop it all up. Thanks a lot. The Driftmaster is an Army Corps of Engineers vessel operated in conjunction with the federal EPA, which collects floating wood, trees, and huge slicks of debris. The vessel is one component of a floatables management plan developed in 1988. In the course of a month, I would say this vessel alone collects upwards of uh, 25 tons of debris. And particularly now, in these summer months, uh, we're going to be, uh, this is our peak time of the year. We're probably good for close to 30 tons in a month. Citizens groups have banded together to collect the debris which accumulates on the area's beaches and back bays. But the ultimate solution to the floatables problem begins back on shore. Uh, yes, people on shore, if they ever had an opportunity to see how much trash is floating out here, I think they would be surprised. I would hope they would be appalled. I think everybody should have an opportunity to see this. Maybe it could be a good lesson. Despite the barriers to access, all around New York, New Jersey Harbor, people find ways to enjoy the waterfront. On the fishing pier at Coney Island, fishers cast their lines and their traps in search of the next big one. Blue claw crabs, summer flounder, winter flounder, scup and snappers are favorite species. Tucked away in Prince's Bay, Staten Island, a small marina where boaters launch their vessels into the wild blue yonder. On the Brooklyn Promenade at twilight, where after work, people watch the ever-changing colors of the sky reflected by the East River. The public enjoys a special right to this and other water bodies in the United States. Anywhere beneath the mean high water mark on the shore is considered public property, held in trust for the people by the state and federal government. This makes the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary by far the largest public space in the region. As the baykeeper, it's Andy Wilner's job as he sees it to speak out on behalf of this public trust and against those who would degrade it. Those people who think that the harbor is, um, is dead, 
are sadly mistaken. I think that the example is to look at the Hudson River. Uh, 25 years ago, people were saying the same thing. It's a sewer, it's not worth saving, there's nothing alive, it's full of PCBs and dioxin. A lot of the same things that they're talking about uh, in the harbor today. So my hope is that 25 years from now, we'll be looking back on it and saying exactly the same thing. It was good that there were people with vision who decided that enough was enough and it was time to actually do something positive for the harbor estuary. I think the most important thing is really is to have a vision of what we want that coastline to be like 50 years from now. And then you have to make decisions that are consistent with that vision. Peter Drucker, the management guru, said that long-range planning is not about future decisions, it's about decisions for the future. And we're at a point now where the decisions that we make about our waterfront are really going to affect the future of the waterfront, and because of that, the future of the Port of New York and New Jersey, the future of, of New York City and our environment. In the last 20 years, it seems the tide has turned this time for the better, in the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary. Many species of marine life are increasing in numbers. Some new species have taken up residence here. But, though in many ways the health of the waters here have improved, it will still be a long time before they regain full health. There are still advisories limiting the consumption of many fish. Shell fishing is still banned in most parts of the estuary. And beach closures are all too common. Centuries of neglect and overexploitation are not easily reversed. It will take the active efforts of we, the more than 15 million busy people who live here, to create a future where all species may be alive in an urban harbor. This program was made possible by the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program, the Marine Sciences Research Center's Institute of Urban Ports and Harbors at the University at Stony Brook, Rutgers University's Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences.